How many of you love change? Oh, come on, Carl left the room, didn't he? You don't have to put those hands up. Yeah, what we found about people that love change, the following is usually true. I understand the change. I believe it's needed. I'm bought in. It's the right thing to do. I'm engaged. I know how to make the link between what I do and where we need to go. And I can get my people engaged. That's how people, like, most people like that type of change. How many like this type of change? You better get out there and make it happen. You better roll that new system out. You better get them to change. How many like that type of change? Yeah. <laughs> you like that type of change. But think about often what the job is of a leader or a manager or a supervisor. Boom, they fall. Do you boo them? Boo, that ain't walking, kid. Get up, you slacker. I've been walking 50 years and that ain't it. No, you don't boo them. You give them the appreciative and the constructive feedback. You tell them, here's what you're doing well, keep doing that. And then you give them the constructive. Here's what you can do to be better. Take your time, keep your balance, move a little slower. It's the combination of both that moves people forward. If all you did was boo them and give constructive, they would be crawling into kindergarten. And he's sitting in on the examination table. My wife and I are both in there. The doctor walks in and he looks up at me and says, Dad, Ladies can't be doctors. I said, he didn't get that from me. I said, Nick, women can do anything they want to do. And his response was, oh, OK. That belief shifted instantaneously on better information. The only reason I tell those two stories is every one of us in this room, you have beliefs about you that reside on both ends of that continuum. And some of them you don't want people to have about you as a leader because they're holding you back. This time somebody comes up to you with an excuse, there's your rebuttal right there. And by the way, it's just the nature of life. We will all come to a point where somebody puts us in a tough situation and you'll have a choice to make. Am I going to find a way to get through this and achieve what matters to me? What else can I do mentality? Or do I go the other direction and say, not my fault, nothing I can do and I give up. Two people can be confronted with the exact same challenge, same barrier, same obstacle, and end up with completely different results. It's a mindset. How bad do you want it? So, Jacob, why did you push back on me when I just pushed on you? You wanted to. It's human nature, gang. I'll tell you what, when you push something on somebody, it is human nature. They will push back if they don't understand, believe, buy in, and if they're not engaged, they will push back. And that's what you see. How many times have you had to roll a new process or system out and you get this pushback? It's human nature. How many of you like to be told you have to change? How many of you are married? It doesn't work so well. Say that again. Go ahead, Bob. Collaboration to do what? The to see the big picture, to recognize our realities. The only way we can see all there is to see is to come together as a team. We need, and by the way, it is the root of creating a highly accountable culture, is making sure that we're recognizing the realities by coming together as a team, having open and candid conversations, seeking perspectives of others, asking for and offering feedback, talking about the elephant in the room, and anticipating opportunities. Seeing your reality has more to do with our ears than it does with our eyes. Think about people you know who consistently achieve and exceed the results they want. They're always up here with that mindset of what else do I need to do to get the result I want. And it's about ownership. If you want it badly enough, there's always some small step you can take to get closer to the result. It's how bad you want it. Do you feel the confusion in the room? <laughs> Multiply that by a thousand, and that's often the confusion we see within teams and organizations. Have you ever worked for a leader, think about this, in your professional career who told you one thing and told the team one thing, and that person acted inconsistently with the message? How much credibility does that person have in your eyes? Zero. How tough is it to regain that credibility? Nearly impossible. The essence of leadership, model the way, do what you say you will do. You are being observed. Don't expect anybody else to change unless they see it in you first. I'd ask you to put your finger up again, but I think you might show me a different finger. Call Aunt Jen and thank her for the card. I thought I heard you say, I guess I don't have to thank you. I said, you realize the golf shoes and the rollerblades, that's from mom and dad. The card said, from mom and dad. And he looked up at me and he said, well, you didn't sign the card. 
And I said, what? And he said, just like this, you didn't sign the card. And at that moment, I wanted to say, you ungrateful little son of a... Do you realize how busy I am? You know how hard I work. You know blah, 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 blah. Instead, I bit my tongue. I wanted to practice what I preach. Went back upstairs, finished packing, come back down. He's still there. I said, hey, Nick, what did you mean when you said I didn't sign the card? And he said, well, Dad, evidently, I'm not important enough for you to take 10 seconds from your day to sign this yourself. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And he wasn't saying it to be a smart ass. Excuse my language. He's a thoughtful, considerate kid. He gets that from his mother. <laughs> Think about that statement as it relates to what Amazon.com did to all the small mom and pop bookstores years ago. They wiped them out, put them out of business, destroyed them. There's destructive and disruptive competition out there in every industry looking to take your market share. And if we're complacent, if we're too focused on managing and not enough emphasis on leading our organizations, we're in jeopardy. So let me ask, where do those beliefs come from? This guy gets a gold star. It's your experiences, it's your lifelong experiences, not just your career and your professional, but your entire personal life as well. So we have you know, 180 people in this room right now. Each one of us has had a different life. Therefore, we have all had different experiences. And ultimately, we all have a different set of beliefs. And those beliefs drive our actions. Experiences that you create as an organization that will differentiate you. You know, any Starbucks fans in here? It's crazy. I, I was, and I'm a Starbucks fan as well. And it's funny because where I live in Pittsburgh. So, you know, you can go to a Sheets or 7-Eleven or Wawa or wherever geographically you are, whatever your store is, and get basically the same cup of coffee and it costs you a quarter of the amount it costs at Starbucks. Yet at Starbucks, we're willing to pay $30 for a cup of coffee because of the experience. Here's the way one of their managers put it. We've identified a third place, and I believe it sets us apart. It's the place that's not work, it's not home. It's the place where people come for refuge. It's the experience. People will pay for the experience. What are the experiences you are creating within your store, within your region, within your district as an organization? What's your name, sir? Ben. Ben? Okay. You sure? I think so. I'm still working on the apps. <laughs> He's still got <laughs> So, Ben, no right or wrong answer here. What's the difference between activity and results? Okay, Ben. <laughs> what was this? I like it. Shout it out, Rich. Activity doesn't matter if you don't get the results. Activity doesn't matter if you don't get the results. I like that. Any other comments here? Yeah, we would say this, that uh, activities are actions people take that lead to results. So let me ask you this. Does all activity produce a result, Walter? Yes, it does. Walter got it right. Most people say no. This guy's a genius. Because even if I do nothing, do I get a result? Yes. You're damn right you do. It's not the result you want, though, right? No. We tend to think of only the positive outcomes of taking actions. The reality is the results are the desired and undesired outcomes of taking actions. So the only reason I put that up there is we want people focused on the result, not activity. Activity in and of itself will not necessarily produce your desired result. Here's the key that you need to understand as leaders. Whatever you counted first in your mind and your brain becomes your truth and your reality. And our minds will not let us see something that we do not believe to be the truth or the reality. Our minds almost say, no, there's no more than three. You saw three, that's your reality, that's your truth. So your mind almost will not let you see four, five, or six. And the only reason I call this to your attention is because if you have folks within Rite Aid who have a belief in their reality and their truth is, we're already doing quite well. We don't need to change. If that's their belief, how likely are they going to change their behaviors to help you achieve what matters most? Not very likely at all. When you go up to 11 to 20 new goals in addition to maintaining the operation, everything becomes one conjumbled mess to your organization. There is no difference, when you're at 11 to 20, there is no difference 
between the new goals and the whirlwind. Everything is the whirlwind. In fact, when you go to 11 to 20, you abdicate leadership of any strategy to the whirlwind. You are no longer leading anything. In fact, you are now managing and maintaining the whirlwind. The highest standard a leader can aspire to achieve. Do your people believe they're playing a winnable game? And when they are, you will achieve engagement levels that are dramatically different than when people come to work playing not to lose. And there's a huge difference between employee engagement and employee satisfaction. There's a lot of highly paid, miserable people out there that do nothing to help us move forward. They might be satisfied, but they're not engaged. You want to create engagement? Create the winnable game. Has anybody tried to put a system to the process? Anybody see two lines, three lines, two lines, three lines? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> How many have in their mind, as you're kind of on chaos right now, what happens to your mind when you're on chaos? It tends to shut down, right? All right, so what I'd ask you to do is with the new system, any, by the way, anything you used or wrote down or took pictures with your phones, which I saw, you can't use it, so flip over any notes. Now on a clean sheet of paper, flip your other one around. I need you to write down this number using the new system. Using the new, and by the way, if you get this right, you get to keep your job. In most organizations, the connotation and perception of accountability is somewhat negative, and it's punitive, it's historic, and it's focused on blame and people feel like we beat people up with accountability. I'm going to share with you that how we can transition that to make accountability something that's positive, engaging, forward-looking, and people actually will like taking accountability. Brand you. Every one of you in this room has a default brand. In other words, it's just how people view you. We all have a default brand, and we achieve that brand based upon the experiences we create for people around us. If you want to know how people truly view you, here's a challenge. Most people don't do this. But if you want to really know how you're viewed by your friends, your family, your peers, and your boss, go out and ask 10 people, five at work, five in your personal life, ask them for five words that come to their mind when they think about you. Collect all the words from the 10 people, You'll have a total of how many words? Five words from 10 people is what? There, you guys are on, you're, you're awake. So you'll have 50 words. Look for the common themes. That's your brand. That's how people see you. Some of us will collect those words. You'll look at it and you'll say, that's what I was hoping for. It's what I wanted. Some of us will collect the words and there'll be stuff on there that you're thinking, wow, I don't want people viewing me that way. And, and just embrace this and internalize this. You'll be better off than when you walked in the door today. Every action you take personally is an experience for everybody around you, everybody watching you. And it is either reinforcing what they already believe about you or you are creating a new belief they will hold about you. Same thing holds true for a department. Every action and experience your department creates for others is developing beliefs people have about your department. And you need to be cognizant, am I creating experiences that are going to foster beliefs, that are going to help me get the results I want, or help my team get the results we want, or am I inadvertently creating experiences that are going to foster beliefs that will potentially hold us back? Do you see when we put some process and a system around that change, your mind's almost released, and you say, I get it, it makes sense, I'm in, I can do this. That's what uh, exemplary leaders will do for their people. They will paint such a crystal clear picture of the future, of where we can be, that people will dive in and suck it up and say, I want in. How can I help? You create a want-to environment rather than a have-to, a pull versus a push, a, a get-to rather than you're forced to, a commitment versus compliance. Effective leaders paint such a crystal clear picture of the future your people will suck it up and they'll want to be involved.
As you know, the, the first rats off the ship are the strongest swimmers, and what I mean by that is in many organizations, when there's that fear-based culture where there's a lot of stress and anxiety, though your top players, your best talent, your key talent, can typically be the first to leave, and you don't want that to happen. The other uh, downside of a burning platform is you're actually burning away your infrastructure. And once the platform burns, right. so when we focus on the your positive and the possibilities, it's you know people naturally come to work wanting to excel and do well. And we can give them clarity on what's the, the opportunity, not only for the organization, but how it's going to impact them personally, how it can benefit them, how it can make their lives better. People tend to really grasp onto that and they, they will become self, you know, I, I'd like to say that our work actually allows people to self-actualize. The issue here, as a manager, supervisor, leader in this room, when you look at that model, where do most managers, leaders, and supervisors focus? On the nevers. Don't do it, you're wasting your time. They're not going to change. And the more you focus on them, the more damage it does to your potentials and maybes and your models. Where's the opportunity in that model? It's the maybes, they're on the fence. That's the group that if you can get them to buy in, and if you move that bell shape just five degrees to the right, has exponential impact in any culture. You get some of those maybes to become models, Man, you're going to accomplish some amazing things. Smart people like to figure things out. How will we make something happen? What are the strategies and the tactics that we need to have in place to achieve what we need to achieve? And rather than creating urgency around those tactics and initiatives, they tend to get very detailed on those tactics and initiatives and push it out to the organization and expect that everybody is urgent around those specific actions. Because it's so logical. Anytime the majority of your people behave a particular way, the majority of the time, the problem is not with the people. It's with the systems and the processes, and the leader has to own that. There are special causes. You may have some nevers. People are stupid, lazy, defiant, just refuse to buy in. But for the most part, if the majority, most of your people, are behaving a particular way the majority of the time, it's not the people. It's the processes and systems, and you as a leader better own it. So, John, there's great leaders who have audacious ideas, and a big key for them to allow those ideas to see them through fruition is to get people to buy in and see Correct. what they see. They have to. And a lot of that can't be done with the logic because you don't have the logic behind what you're about to attempt to undertake. So what do you see? And, for example, I'll give you a quick idea. When Steve Jobs recruited John Scullion to yeah. help with Apple. Yeah, yeah. The story I heard, and it may oh, not yeah. be true, was that do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water or do you want to make a dent in the universe? Right. That appeals to the heart. Oh, no, no question about it. I mean, uh, if the idea is big enough, and you see this with the Apple, you see it with the Netscapes, you see it with lots and lots of these astonishing stories, there is no way to get people to buy in by showing them enough numbers by showing them enough data. It just is, it, it, it won't, you can't make the logical case for something that's just over the top. And biggest obstacle standing between them and the results they truly want is the behavior of other people. Changing your own behavior, easy or hard? Hard. Changing someone else's behavior, easy or hard? Even harder. What if they know there's something in it for their best interest? Still hard, right? How about changing the behavior of a whole lot of other people? So, John, we're often asked from uh, organizations that we work with and the leaders that we uh, communicate with, when do we know that they need to move from change management to change leadership? Uh, and what, do you, what typical advice do you give to those folks? Well, it's, it's a good question. You're right. We're often asked that. I think number one is to do an accurate count of how many people are going to have to really change what they do. Uh, people underestimate that, of course, all the time. They say, you know, 50 of our managers are going to have to, and you push them. And then, well, okay, yeah, a lot of people in the sales force are going to have to do it. And, oh, yeah, yeah, IT people, and you start adding it up, and it's a much larger number. If you do that honestly, I think uh, when you cross maybe 20% of the total population you're dealing with, 
it starts to become um, shaky on just doing the sh uh, change management stuff. I know we talked once, and you threw out a figure that was bigger than that, right? Uh, I would say 20 to 50 percent. When you, huh, 20 right. to 50 percent right. of those in your organization got to do something substantially different or will be impacted by the change. You, you, you're moving into the change leadership. Yes. I think another indice is simply that you're doing change leadership in a sophisticated way. You actually are spending more money on it. You're bringing in more expertise, tools, and yet it's not working. And right. oftentimes we just know that the, when the stakes are extremely high, that's another indicator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, at a certain point, stakes are high. Almost always that means more people have to change. Um, and that brings us back to change leadership. And, uh, um, and people underestimate the stakes involved in a rapidly changing world. I am convinced um, all the time. They run the economic numbers, the kind of the psychological numbers, if you will. Um, people are underestimating the stakes associated with change.